everyone. It is Datu Tim, and this is FMA Talk Live. So my co-host is MIA at the moment. We were talking earlier, um, so he is going to be here. I don't know when, um, but thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I'm going to get my banners going. I do have uh, Master Parsons going to be on tonight. Uh, I'm going to put my chats up here. So um, everyone, please stay, say hello, and I hope things are going well. Um, uh, I'm going to be multitasking here, so I'm going to find out where my, my main man, Ty, is. But in the meantime, um, as usual, we have Tim's tirade. So the, um, something's going on and, um, you know, I'm dealing with stuff as usual. So, um, so let's get into it. So right off the bat, um, and, uh, hey, Scott, I'm glad to see you're on board. Um, and I don't know where PG is. <laughs> I might, I might, I might call him on the phone and go, Hey brother, the show is started. Uh, matter of fact, I'll probably do that right now. Hey, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's have some fun here. I want to put on speaker too. So, um, I'm gonna call Ty. I'm put him on speaker. Shh. No one let him know he's there. Shh. It's a secret. Of course, he might. He's got. There's the phone dialing. You could have something going on at the house. I know he's got family over, so I don't want to be a major pain in the butt. But I don't know where my my co host is. But that's okay. We're gonna keep moving with this. Your call has been, been forwarded, forwarded to an automated, automated voice man. Message. Okay. All right. So I will just uh, text message him and say. Hey, we're doing the show. I sent you an invite. Feel free to log in. Or not. LOL. So I sent him a message. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully he'll get this. Okay, in the meantime, uh, hey, Mr. Cribs, how you doing? And hello, Chris. Okay, so, um, so we, uh, as usual, there's something going on. Someone complaining about the show, and we keep asking people to come on board, and they're not. So I'm going to make some comments since they made some things. So, um, you know, I wasn't going to do that. Actually, you know what? Here we go. Let's do this. Hey, it is Master Rich Parsons. How you doing, Rich? I didn't even give him a heads up. I just <laughs> he's in here. He's in. Here. How you doing, Rich? It's a good thing I wasn't taking a drink. Yeah, well, or, or something else. <laughs> How are things in uh, sunny or not so sunny Flint, Michigan? Everything's wonderful right now. Thank you, Tim. Excellent. And, Excellent. and uh, okay, Mr. Uh, Jason said hello. Jason, you know I'm doing a se seminar in September down by you guys now. Uh, and you know Chris uh, Callahan, right? Yeah, Chris is from the Flint area. Yep. Training as well Cribs. as Mr. Cribs is on tonight, too. Yep. Chris is training with Mr. Cri Master Cribs right now as well. Master Parsons. What's up? What's <laughs> up? Okay. So um, I was going to do my tie rate. I still may do my tie rate. Who knows? Oh, let's do it right now. Um, yes, I'll be there. Good, 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 good. So, um, and, and Rich has been around for a lot of this stuff too. So I don't normally like bringing the guests in, but, but Rich is – is like a, a brother from another mother we've we've seen and um done a lot of stuff together and been on the road and there's ernie saying hello when he talks about hey, ratting because ratten, he does, can't he can't pronounce rattan he's got to call it ratten so um and mr terrell ah the terrell master terrell has got a few good questions for us tonight I so, guess, you know what um i'm gonna skip my tirade tonight uh you know i was gonna go off uh, there's been some comments and, uh, I, I want to, I want to just do things a little differently. So we'll, we'll work on that another time. Um, my phone's blowing up, telling me all the notifications that the show has started. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know the show has started. So, um, normally PG Ty would be here. I messaged him earlier today. He's planning on being here and I'm assuming he will, he's probably having a little tech issue on his end but we'll uh we'll have him come in later um if not we'll send out a search party so um 
today's topic is how modern Arnis they're about the relationship between modern Arnis and Balintawaka Screamer. Now, um, there's been a lot of talk about some things over the uh over time with this, and I want to uh I don't know if that is that any better sound. I can't even tell I don't have my headset on, so um can everyone hear me out there? I can hear you, Tim. Okay, yeah. All right, this now my now it's all getting ready to fall over. You know, not that I prepared for this earlier. Oh, wait a minute, I did. Okay, sometimes it gets a little goofy here. All right. Um, so there's been a lot of comments about uh sounds good. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, and uh welcome aboard, Frank. And Frank is gonna be on a show uh in a week or two. I'm not sure exactly. I think it's two, but you know. Um Talking about Connecticut modern Arnis, because that'll be good. Um, all right. So right off the bat, there's been a lot of talk about modern Arnis and Balintawak. And I've, I've got my other screen. I normally don't. I'm going to move my screen over because I've been told sometimes when I look at the screen, it um, it makes me look like I'm not paying attention to you guys out there. And I am most of the time. Most of the time. Most of the time. Most of the time. Well, it's just there's some other... There's some other things that come in on the other screen. So I have multiple screens up so I can get messages from other platforms. So um, I have some people who uh, will uh, make some comments on Facebook or Facebook Messenger specifically. So I usually keep that up. Uh, and I had a, a very good dialogue with uh, with Master uh, Richardson earlier today. So I want to ask a few of these questions. He and I, I gave him my point of view on some things, but, you know, uh, you are in our group, the Balintawak Special. So first of all, uh, let's get into a little about yourself. Okay. You uh, are part of a select group of people um, who've studied modern Arnis and Balintawak, specifically the Bacon Buit lineage. Now, there's other people who've done, there's other modern Arnis people who've done some Balintawak, but yes. this is specifically... Bacon Buit. Now, um, one, can you tell us a little about, we know Bacon, but can you tell us about Buat? <clears throat> Ted Buat um, was an engineer, transferred to the U.S., uh, has been here since the mid-70s, has uh, over time had a small group of uh, students, and um, they've, a few of us are out there trying to uh, progress the art. Um, yourself, myself, Dave Hatch, um, a few others that are doing things um, privately or with their own little groups. But Ted um, was one of those that when he started training, he um, was very serious and he was very critical of himself. So he trained and trained and practiced and practiced and then became very serious. And within about a year of training, um, Anchon was trusting him to teach the basics to other students as they walked in the club. So, so uh, it was that the norm or was he? No, no. Uh, other than Ted, the only person who taught at Anton's club was Anton. Okay. All right. Um, so. Um, but caveat that there were many other clubs. Many of them were senior students. Okay. They were teaching on their own. Anchan knew about it. Anchan supported it. So this is not derogatory to anybody who came from the other lineages to Anchan who had their own clubs as well. Okay. So um, I got a question from Michael Cribbs. Uh, Rich, do you know how many students exactly? Um. <laughs> I would assume how many students who taught for and open on Ted's. Yeah. I don't know. Can you elaborate on that question just to make sure we get the answer proper? Do you know of anyone other than Manung Ted who taught for, um, who taught at the headquarters for Anchon when he wasn't in the club? No, I do not. Okay. Okay. Uh oh, how many students did Ted teach? Well, that 
I think we know, or well, we have a we have a close estimation, right? Yeah. So there's about 33, 34 pictures on the picture board, um, but there are many people who didn't get their pictures taken either due to timing because um, there'd have to be another person present or there would be, um, they came and trained for a short period of time and didn't stay. Um, or they would only train every once in a while. And then like for me, it was almost a year before I got my picture taken just due to the timing I was there. No one else was in the house for us to get a picture taken. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let me, um, so, okay, good. I do have a folder. Uh, okay. So if you did an estimate, I'd say between 35 would be the low end and I'd say 50 or so would be the high end. Um, yeah. Okay. So we talked about, okay. Um, so Rich made this comment about the picture board. So I, uh, have a folder over. Oh shoot. I don't have a folder. Well, I don't have that photo handy. I do have a, I want to look for it. Basically what Manung Ted had is in his basement. Rich has got it right there. Uh, I had a digital copy of this and that was everyone who, um, that was the fr the family. So that's the people who study with Manung Ted. So let me ask you this as I'm looking in my folder, not ignoring people, but trying to, <laughs> well, yeah. trying to pull up other media. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to do it at the same time. Um, and I, I had, we had the, we had the birthday photo, but that's not what, you I know, this would be a great time if your co-host could ask me these questions and you could pull the, I, yeah, I, it would be great, you know, because <laughs> love you. Yeah. You know, he's, he's got to have something going on because he's always, I just hope everything's good with his family. And, uh, Mike Cribb says, I need a digital copy of that, please. Um, oh, you should have just screenshot. <laughs> Okay, let me see here. I think Dave Hatch has put it up on the on the internet as well. Yeah, I think uh, I have a digital copy online, Mike. I will make sure I tag you for it. Yeah, and I'll I'll look at my stuff because I have a whole bunch of folder. I got a ah, you know what? I do have it here. Okay. Let me open this up and I'm going to share. Share my screen. Yep. Do this. Uh, where is it? All my cameras are right in the way. Right in the way. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to maximize what we're looking at here. And I'm going to make us go away completely. I'm going to get rid of the brand. Rich, you're still with us, right? Yes. Okay. So here is what I have. And I'm going to do this on the other screen. Okay, so this is what was on Manung Ted's board in the basement. All we're going to go by is what he put up there. And if you didn't have your photo, it's it's not our problem. <laughs> there's only so much we can do. And like I said, if you were waiting for someone for a photo, there's not much we can do about it. So, um, yeah, I know that like Jeff Owens never got his photo taken. Yeah. And, and we know that Jeff is trained. So, right. Um, so, um, all right. So we got all these people here. Jay Spiro, Rocky was Rocky's up here. Uh, Lance. I haven't seen Lance in years. Uh, I think the last time I saw him was at Ted's 75th birthday. Yep. Jay Spiro. We have, and I'm going to just mention the people that I really know. Ian Kinder. I bumped into once or twice. Uh, I know David. Um, let me see Jim Powers, the late Jim Powers. Um, Ian Kershaw, I think I bumped into once or twice. Mike Favaza was married to Melissa, his daughter. Ted oh, okay, okay. And then I know, I know uh, Dave Kicka very well. Uh, oh, then look, Rich Parsons, look at that same year he studied. Mike Cribbs, right there. Um, bum, 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 bum. That's why I started in 2000. Rob Perkins. Yeah, he's deceased. He passed away yeah. uh, many years, a few years ago, yes. Okay, and then uh, Kevin Black was one of my guys. He came in with me. 
uh, Rob Ryson. Paul Linson is the tattoo artist. Uh, Paul John Nillis, Dan Anderson, Eric, and David, and yeah. So I, I'm going to point. I'm going to say something about this right here. Uh, I just want to see who that was. Well, who's who's that with David? That's actually Manung Ted. After the stroke, he didn't get a picture taken. He'd oh, been okay. trained for about a year or so, which but... explains why he doesn't. Okay, got it. Yep. You know, um, the thing here is this: this does not. This list does not, I'm going to get rid of it right now, talk about how much training anybody did. All it did is when you started that class. So um, of the people that um, were on that list, the, the photos that we saw, mm -hmm. what percentage do you think dropped off in the, the first six months? decent percentage but not i don't know many of them trained for years but then they would start coming once a year or once every other year or um when others took interest they would come back okay um but i would say many of those who trained for a short period of time um either didn't get their picture taken or um but there's probably one two, three, about three or four that might have been on that picture board that were six months or less. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so less than 40, so less, that's less than 10, it's about 10%. Okay. And then, uh, and this isn't this, this, this show is not about Ted Buat. We're going to talk about how it relates to modernities, but I'm just, I want to put a little context because of who we're having in and the lineage we're going with. Um, I didn't know I was on trial. <laughs> yeah, there we go. The uh, the um, how many how many students do you think Monk Ted had that were active before his retirement? He yeah. usually tried to keep it to between five and seven to not have more than one a day, um, and he always took Sundays off. So um, after his retirement. He did increase that a little bit, which is why you see the numbers getting closer towards the end. He wasn't working as much overtime. And then after he retired, he could pick up more. But it still was probably, um, so Kinder, myself, Kershaw, um, you, Janulus, Ryson, Perkins, before he died, um, were pretty consistent. And then the new students, um, post Ben Simon. So whatever their schedules were. Um, okay. So maybe about 10 people at the end. Um, I'd say five or so of the older students and about four or five of the newer. Yeah. About 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's not to say that other people weren't training, but they, they, they weren't, they were doing it once a month, once a quarter, okay. once a year. But this wasn't a huge, this, I mean, where, where were we training? We were training in Manung Ted's basement. And what was the unique portion of what he did on the floor in the basement? <laughs> yeah, we had about a six foot by eight foot square that we worked in. Why was that? Because that was reminiscent of the area that they had to work at the watch shop in the backyard. Yep. He actually taped out the floor uh, of um, of the uh, of the training area. And it <laughs> it was very tight, let me tell you. Um, okay, so let's so we talked a little about your lineage and stuff. Um, now how did you get into this this thing in the first place? Because like I said, you had both. So how did that all come about? So a good friend of mine introduced me to Modern Arnis back in 86. Um, I never quit. I just kept showing up. Um, then in the 90s, um, Jim Power was trying to get with Manung Ted. And as I said, he had limited time and space because he had family, work, and so forth. So um, it took him a couple of years to get in and it says he got in here in 96 
So um, I know for about 94 ish on, he was working to um, actively try to get in. And for about a year or so, he trained with Rocky prior to that as well. Until okay. a spot opened up. Okay. Okay, it looks like my co host is making a comment on Facebook Messenger, everybody. <laughs> Love you, Ty. Hope everything's oh, okay. He had, he had problems with Storm and other stuff. Uh, let me see here. All right. Um, trying to see what he says. He, he so he's there's a storm evidently where he's at. So it's been messing up everything down there. Um, oh, he's responding. Let's see what. Let's see. It says, "Yep, should be good now." Sorry again. All right. Um, all right. Oh, okay. So when he logs in, okay, everyone, don't tell him. When he logs in, we'll say that it was a great show. Oh, wait, man, I think he heard me. Hey, how you doing, Ty? We're just <laughs> wrapping things up. Hey, Ty. <laughs> all right, well, I hope it was a good visit. It's good seeing oh, you guys. I'm going to catch you all later. See you later, <laughs> buddy. All right. How are um, you doing, Rich? Sorry I, sorry I was late. There's storms here and other stuff. Um, I'm just glad you're healthy and safe. That is always good. You too, sir. Thank you. All right. Um. So I didn't. We didn't do the tirade. I I, I skipped that today. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a, a question for regrouping, and then uh, we'll go from there. So what Rich just told us how he got involved. We talked about Mon and Ted first because that's the lineage that we're going to talk about. He talked about how he uh, how he got involved with modern, and then uh, a spot opened up for him to work with with um, Ted. Um, so now I'll say this when it comes, okay. So when it comes, okay. So there's a, actually, let me get a couple of these questions that were, that were followed up here. I got to move my screen. Cause you know how that is. So first of all, we have, uh, we have greetings from Costa Rica, Costa Rica had a great fortune to study, um, with uh, Professor Praises back in 81 in Los Angeles. That's aw Actually, I didn't even know he did anything in L.A., so that's amazing. I'd love to hear about that. Um, feel free to message me directly or email me, drtim at gmail.com, because I would like to get some intel about that. Because um, that was right around the time he started moving to the East Coast. Yeah, so, he'd already um, been to the East Coast once or twice and to the central Chicago Flint area few times as well. Okay, so uh here was a question. Was there a re was there a required belt rank previous to starting training with Manung Ted? Uh I never heard anything like that, but Rich, how about you? No, there are people who've never trained in any martial arts who were training with Ted. Um no absolute requirement to train with him. Now here's he what did I'm not give out any rank certificates or right. any belt promotions. We do have a, a a family diploma, a lineage diploma, which I was I was really pushing for for years, and they eventually did it to show who studied with Ted. But I don't know what criteria there was fulfilled in that because if I was doing that, I would have put a a minimum class. I'm like, hey, if you only did like five classes, no, you're not part of that, you know. Um, but you know, I don't know what it came of that. Um, Jeremy says hello. And then uh, you know, Mike makes a comment, and um, he goes, I asked him why the place was so small. He said, he, so you don't run away, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> maybe because maybe Mike likes to run away. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. Listen, he taped it out on the floor because that was the dimensions of the club in Cebu. He was so OCD on that, you know. Um, and then Maria... How are you doing? Como esta ca, mi amore? Okay, here we go. So, and I was about to ask questions, but Terrell, who was, and I were talking earlier, he's got a question. So, let's go with this one, and we can talk about some of his other questions. Say, so, who was the first black belt in modern East and the East Coast, 
and was the first person included to promoting modern ace on the east. okay uh i don't know um i don't know i don't know uh, who the first was i know in 76 when he was in chicago he could follow 75 in chicago he followed it up with flint in the early um i have an idea <laughs> So my, I, I wasn't going to, you know, we we're going to try to keep this more on the Blintwalk side of questions. So I, and Terrell shared some Blintwalk questions with me. So I was planning on throwing them out. Um, yes, sorry, Terrell. I don't have that piece of data. Well, no, I got one on you. My assumption, my, what I'm going to assume is the first black belt would have been Joe Bridenstine. So the first, and we're talking coast because we're East Coast. Okay, and not, not Midwest. Correct. Right. Exactly. We're going. <laughs> I was like, okay, so I'm going to tell you something about New York State. It's very important to know this. <laughs> there are four sections of New York State. But if you're in New York City, you're considered downstate. If you're, if you're in New York City, and you consider everyone else upstate. And that's not. Upstate is Albany. Central New York is Syracuse. And Buffalo, where I live, is Western New York. Learn to read a map. But anyways. <laughs> so, so if anyone's, I don't want anyone's to, I don't want to get butt hurt when we say this. We're making a theoretical, we're making this an, a, a, a theory here based on the data that we have. And with more data, we may change that opinion on things, but most likely, and we're talking about geographic, so East Coast versus Midwest. So, um, East Coast, I would say it would have been Joe Bridenstine. He went to the first camp in 1983 in West Virginia, and he was the one that brought Remy up to Philadelphia to do the two-week-long camps starting the year after that. They only did the – the Remy Prasis Modern East Camp was a one-off in West Virginia, and then another group took over the spot the year after. Don't know, don't care. That's not what we're talking about at the moment. But if there were no black belts prior to that event, Joe Bryden, or East Coast, Black Bells. Joe Bridenstein probably would have been the guy. And he was running the camps in Philadelphia. They were doing two week long camps for like three, four years in a row. So I know that Jeff Arnold, Jeff Fields, and Bob DeMott all had Black Belts 76 through 78 time frame, which is great. Midwest. Correct. So, you know, so, um, so that would be East coast and was the person involved in promoting. Well, Joe Bridenstine would have been the, the East coast guy who started promoting modern because he was hosting the camps. So from there, what eventually happened is they started the Midwest camp, which Terry Warham, I guess, attended the Philadelphia camps and then started one at MSU, Michigan state university. Which ended up being the longest running camp um, for yeah. Remy while he was alive. 86 through 2000. Yeah. Yeah, I don't count the retro <clears throat> ones. I know they're like, oh, it's the longest running camp. It's still going. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, for me, when Remy stopped teaching in 2000, that's it. It shut it down. Then, uh, then it's a whole new era. A whole new entity. So, um, but that would be it. Then. Cribs didn't know that. Okay. Um, well, there you go. I, <laughs> I, and actually, you know, we we talked about a whole bunch of things. I was actually trying to get a. Well, we'll we'll talk about. It. I was trying to get Ted to do some special classes for us, uh, where it would be like the old days. Ah, mabute guapo. That's, that's <laughs> me, by the way. And then, uh, hey, Rich, that's from Carl. Hey, Carl. Okay. Right. Um. Let me ask the questions that Terrell had on that he sent me earlier today. So, and then I'm going to let uh, my man PG Ty ask a few questions here because I've been kind of monopolizing things. Well, plus I have to catch up. Okay. <laughs> here was the question. Okay. okay. I would like to submit it. I get the word. Okay. Here he goes. Uh, would you consider Remy a first or center, uh, second generation student of uh, of Balintwak? I know my opinion on this. I would say first generation 
student of Balintawak. But he didn't start as a first generation student of Anshan Bakan. Correct. So why don't you tell us about the path? Yeah, so he started with uh, Mankal, who was a left-hander. Um, so he was a young man between 14 and 15 when he left home and went up to Cebu on a ferry. Um, <clears throat> so doing odd jobs, working the docks and so forth, but he also picked up um, studying with Mankal and learned a lot because he was left-handed. After a period of time, Mankal moved him over to Moranga, who was uh, one of the more senior uh, students, instructors underneath and John, and then Moranga moved him up later to train with Anchan. Um, Remy was both always anxious for more knowledge, and um, they didn't hold him back from seeing the source. So, if you wanted to say he started with Moncal, first generation Balintawak, but um, he ended up training with Anchan at the end. So, like in modern Arnie, several of the players, like myself and others, like yourself, we yep. started with a different uh, teacher than Remy, but were passed up one way or another. So, you started maybe second or third generation down the road. Like, Remy would have been, like, uh, third generation, and then eventually was, became a first generation student of Remy's, or of yeah. Anchon's. Anchon's, yeah. Okay. Now, we don't know how much time he spent with Anchon, do we? Well, <clears throat> it's specific. He, he was opening his club back in Nigaran in, when he was 20. So there's a six-year period where he did traveling and training. Okay. Um, somewhere in there, he had the incident um, where he ended up leaving. <laughs> <laughs> the incident. <laughs> Tell, okay. <laughs> well, I don't think it was the incident. I think he planned on leaving. So tell us. Okay. Well, okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll open up. Remy wanted to be the, t okay. If you knew Remy, let's see. What did Ted call Remy? Re Remy said, no, Ted Re said Remy had big brass balls. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Um, quote, unquote. I didn't ask why he knew that. I just, it was TMI, too much information. But he's always about being the top fighter. That was it. He wanted to be the top fighter. This is Remy Price, the creator of Modern East, which a lot of people don't realize. He used to fight for Anchon. Is that correct? Yeah, he fought with many people for fun. Mm -hmm. But I mean, didn't they also do like challenge matches and stuff like that? They would do challenge matches and they would work each other and yeah. And and he'd represent the gym. Yes. Okay. So the top fighter was Delphine Lopez and Remy Prasis under Anchon. Yes. And when I asked Remy once, I go, could you ever take Anchon without batting an eye? He was like, no way. Which mm -hmm. made me think, oh my God. This uh, uh, Remy can slap me around all day long and doesn't even bat an eye and said that he couldn't take on Anchon, which makes me wonder how tough this guy was. Little guy, too, because he was, like, small. Oh, there's a picture of Anchon right now next to Ted. So he's barely, he's a little, he's about up to his ear, and Remy's about the same height. And Remy's a freaking bull. So... The top guy was Delphine Lopez. Well, the top two guys were Remy and Delphine under Anchon. What's so unique about Delphine Lopez there, Master Parsons? Uh, Delphine was known to fight right-handed with a stick and left-handed with a 45. Stick and 45. Nice. So what were people worried about? Being shot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, not even in a screamer can you block bullets with a stick. You know, um... So, he knew if he fought Delphine that he would end up looking like Swiss cheese. Yeah. Well, if he laid a stick on him. If he laid, yes. So, the way it started was there was a, a, a young bully going around and 
challenging people who really didn't know, have any training and he would just knock them out. And then he started getting a little bit better um, fighters and still knocking people out. And so his level of arrogance and challenge kept going. So Remy just stood by one of those fights and waited for him to challenge him. <laughs> and then he went out and beat him up, didn't knock him out, but made sure that he knew he was beaten. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, or fortunately, that young man was, um, mind you, Remy was young as well, um, was the nephew of Delphin. And so the word came out that Delphin was looking to meet up with Remy. And um, so when Remy went to Anchon and asked him, um, can I take him? He goes, mm, depends on the day. He goes, but remember, what does he have in his left hand? And he said, okay. He, he goes, yeah, I might, I'll take my chances with a stick, but I can't dodge bullets. So he chose to leave. Yeah, I got a slightly different story. Okay, that's fair. Um, a lot of the same gist. Um, allegedly, Anchon gave him the sign that he could take him, and instead of taking him because he had a police force and guns and all this other stuff, right? he, he took out his nephew instead. And that's when Remy said, I got to go because if I <laughs> stay here, I'm dead. But if he comes to my li island, he'll be dead. So uh, kind of still, let me see here. Uh, Rich, here's a question from uh, what, okay, what camp did you go to where they wanted to promote you to black belt? The 1986 camp, the first uh, MSU camp. Okay. You did or didn't get promoted that year? I got a basic instructor certificate, no rank. So I could promote people higher than the color right. belt I was wearing. <laughs> the first Michigan camp? Yes. Wasn't that 87? 86. <clears throat> no, 87. You're right. 87. Yeah, because I got my black belt in 88 the year after. Uh, Mike Cribb says, hi, Ty. Hey, Mike. Steve from <clears throat> Greg. How you doing, brother? Okay, here we go. Okay. Now. And Chris LaCava says hello. I haven't heard from you in a while. Hey, Chris. How you doing? So, here we go. How much Balintwak did Professor have in the words of many years of Balintwak? Did you... Um, did he have... And was Professor training the sometime with Bobby... Okay. So he left home around 14. Okay. Um, he was back home around 20, opening up his gym. So at most, there's a six-year period. And in there, he did a little bit of traveling as well. So you can figure about four to five years, okay? Um, probably closer to three or four. As to where does my good friend Bobby fall into that? Um, so if you look at Remy's birthday... Of uh, being in 36, 14 years old makes it 1950. <clears throat> Excuse me, which puts um, went on Bobby at about one or two years old. So I doubt they were training at the same time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, guys. Yeah, I was going to look this up and to try to find a, a birth date on Bobby. I mean, uh, we, we did. Uh, Ty, well, you, even if Bobby's 70th birthday, right? We did the 70th, yeah. When was that? Ooh, a couple of years, three years ago, something like that, four years maybe. Okay, so I should say 75 for rough, right? So 20 years back gets us to the turn of the century. Go back 55 years, right? Puts us at 45. So in 1950 to 1955, he would have been five to 10 years old. Yeah. Right. But Rich, I thought that uh, Remy was with uh, Moncal one to two years, and then Moranga for a couple few, and then overlapping with Anshong for a couple few. But I know there wasn't, you know, it wasn't a hard and fast. Line. Yeah, the, the, the answer was the question was blunt lock, not Anshong. So you're absolutely correct. Okay, so it's more like eight <sighs> total with some <clears throat> gaps and things, probably. Okay. Yeah, so spending the time with Moncal, and then spending the time with Moranga. It was about a couple years with Moncal, was about 18 months with Moranga, and then some more time with Moranga and Anchon. 
So and I know he had over a year with that child. So, and also know that he devoted to, when he was there, right? Just ton, tons of time when he wasn't working. It was pretty much <laughs> all yeah. bonking heads, right? Okay, so mm -hmm. Ted. Uh, okay, um, Bobby was born in '48. '48. Okay. So Remy was doing balloon walk around. What where we, what we say he was born about 50, 51. 1950 to 55. So, okay. <laughs> he was three year old. He, I, I, yeah, he probably didn't even pick up a, and actually he was an adult when he was training because Bobby was doing bare knuckle boxing. Yep. So there was no way that they would have really. Been he might've been doing the bare knuckle boxing at the gym that they were training balloon to lock when he was five or six. But I don't think he was training the Balintawak yet, based upon the conversation I have with Bobby. Yeah. yeah, I think Bobby was more in his 20s when he was doing stuff like that. So, and then Jeff just signed in. Okay. Hey Jeff. All right. Hey Jeff. So, um, well, I got three of my uh, three of my Michigan friends on there. Nice. Well, look, you've got three friends. <laughs> well, that's uh, the same number. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, totally three. I'm trying to look to see if there was any other questions that Terrell and I were talking some good stuff. Uh, so to answer one of the things that Ty brought up, um, Remy went and visited Anchan. And, you know, he'd take him a bottle of whiskey. He'd take him other gifts. <clears throat> so he was there training with him one day. One of the other students came up to his small little hut shack that he lived in. And then Remy said, oh, let me go see what they want. <clears throat> so he'd go out and tell them, Anton's not feeling well today. You know, come back tomorrow to train with him. And then he'd go back inside and say, oh, that guy, even if the other guy brought alcohol for him, he would say, oh, yeah, he wanted to give you this alcohol because he's not feeling well today. So he didn't, couldn't train with you, but he still wanted to let you know that he was planning. So therefore, he would get more training time. So um, say what you want. Remy wasn't always the <laughs> the innocent. Okay. Uh, here's another question that Terrell asked me earlier. Do you think that Remy did the, the groupings? No. I don't I don't think they were created at the time that Remy was training there. Um, you know, I'd really love to get a I gotta talk to Ver Villius and um Jose so uh, since then, the guy that was online that brought up the history of the groupings and how it came from Velez and was given to his very good friend, Billison, who had the larger club, and then it spread from there. Um, <clears throat> I don't think the timing would have aligned with the same timing that Remy would have been there. If it was, it would have been at the end of his timing, and it wouldn't have had, and he didn't cross with those as trainers. Okay. Now, um, so, uh, so we're, uh, the question was, okay, who trained Blint walk first, Remy or Bobby? It would have been Remy. Um, no disrespect to Benung Bobby. Okay, now, now what's what? We're just talking about chronological. Okay, so um, we're good friends. All of us are here are good friends with him. So, so uh, so this came up. I don't know how you want to interpret this. This, this, this okay, now this who was senior to whom, and I. And the thing here is, we we've run into this conversation. So, uh, so was Bobby uh, senior to Remy, or vice, or was Bobby junior to Professor? So here's what I'm going to say. Remy studied it first, but he left. He left to create his own thing, his own system, which Balintwak was part of. But I don't say think that. I I think. <coughs> different um like if you talked in the family you know okay here here's what i'm going to say in filipino culture if you're uh you're still po if you're older so ernesto praises best friend was lito conception 
And they're out the one time. He goes, hey, you can be the grandmaster all you want, but I'm still Poe because I'm more, I'm a day older than you. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, there, so <clears throat> yes, Remy would always be Bobby Sr. because it's a cultural thing. Yes. Um, and 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 here's the thing too is modern Arnis has such a rich a rich a rich uh, a, a huge um, a wide breadth of curriculum where Balintwalk is a very specific field of expertise. Would you? Yes. What do you okay? So, can you um, now? I know you understand where I'm coming from. Why don't you tell the viewers, like, <clears throat> what's so specific that what, what you know, like, where is Balintwalk in the like the martial art world is in general? Is this a full art? Is it striking a grappling? Uh, you know, blah blah blah. Some of the lineages have added in a little bit of grappling, some of them have added in a little bit of knife work, and those instructors need to be given the proper credit. So that people, when they do their lineage studies, can understand where things came from, and don't assume that everybody should have that. My opinion. Um, so, and in this case, that would give credit to like Menon Bobby, who's put some knife work and some other stuff in that wasn't there from his instructors or from from Anja. <clears throat> the um, stick dueling. So, Balintawak is an optimized stick dueling system. Um, so, two people are mad at each other. They've signed waivers. People can die. Let's go hit each other. <clears throat> Modern Arnis is stick, blade, long and short, empty hand, improvised weapon, and let's survive this and get away first. Um, and then second, let's have fun. And third, yeah, we can make it more combative, um, but that depends upon the individual. So... There's nothing wrong with e either one for their approaches. Um, just that one was a very optimized stick dueling system. The other one put a lot more into it. Can you do the empty hand from the stick? You can do a lot of it, yes. But you have to understand the empty hand <clears throat> and understand the translations or the range and understand the changes that it's going to cause. You just can't just switch it up automatically and have it work you're gonna have to review it yeah and this is one of the things is in filipino martial arts uh as a whole we've talked about this during the extinction uh episode one of the reasons why i feel that filipino martial arts aren't uh as popular as they could be and you don't see schools you see more training clubs is because they're not standalone systems they're akin to say judo I mean, I'm sorry, akin to say, well, actually, you could say judo, which is just a small portion of jiu-jitsu. Uh, it would say it more like um, fencing or kendo or yaido, where it's a very specific weapon system. And I look at a lot of Filipino systems, and they don't address open hand. Matter of fact, what they'll do is they'll say, well, train with this, you know, you know, do some JKD trapping or Wing Chun or boxing or or find something else for your open hand technique. A lot of them will do some form of BJJ and some form of boxing, kickboxing element. You, what do you guys think about that, Ty? Uh, I mean, that feels right to me. I think people look for something to latch on to, right? And if they don't see it quickly, it's it's going. You're not going to catch the the opportunistic folks. <laughs> kind of like leaving your uh, leaving your uh, front door unlocked, right? That'll catch the opportunistic thief, but it's not going to do anything for the really person who knows what they're doing. Yeah. Rich? Yeah. Um, I don't think the techniques you learn can be applied in a lot of different ways. Yes. But the optimization is for stick dueling. So it's singular minded and singular focus. Yeah. Now, you look at training levels. If everything moves up at a level, that's one way of training. Another way of training is get really good at one thing, and then everything around it slowly comes up at a different proportional rate. Um, so by improving your timing and understanding of the stick work, 
your handwork and your blade work will also come by association, but it does take the time and the homework as with all things. And and when I'm not, when I say this, I'm not trying to dog Filipino martial arts because I love Filipino martial arts. It's just that a lot of systems don't aggressively deal with open hand combatives. You know, when I when I uh, did Balintwak, Manung Ted, <coughs> well, actually I didn't say did, I do Balintwak. But when I was training with Manung Ted before a stroke, and I asked the question once about open hand combatives, and that's I got a 45 minute lesson that I of my <coughs> life that I'll never get back, and that was. I mean, hindsight being twenty twenty was probably the best thing I could do to see what he had, hmm. but I was dreading the material he was teaching me because I thought that material was terrible. It really didn't address, you know, and 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 it would be stuff that yes, at your skill level you could pull this off because of the decades of motor memory, hmm. but if we're talking about what you would teach a beginner with no skill set, this would be the last thing I would have done. I and mean, he's trying to do subligs and tokasas and all this other stuff. I'm like. You know, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I never went down that path. Again. Now, but a lot of Filipino martial arts are the same way. You know, it's, I'm not just, you know, you know, or they say, oh, listen, here are the angles attack. Well, here's a number one with my hand. Yeah, you could do that. And, you know, against someone who's got no training, yeah, it's all the same. But what if, what if you have someone who's got some street experience? And that's where I'm coming from on this. So let me uh, just catch up with some of these comments. So, uh, Terrell uh, would say that there was. Uh, would you say that there are, there was two, or is two blank? Well, we'll talk about that. And then he liked my statement. Love the statement. Okay, so here he he reiterated this as well. So um, I actually got the chart up. I was doing this. Um, there are two lineages of Balintwak. Uh What would you? What would they be? Grouping and non-grouping? Correct. Um, I actually don't look at that. I actually look at the families who bring it because they do something different. But Rich, let's hear your feedback on that. Uh, so from a very high level, you could say that. I look at it from three major family groups. The grouping methodologies and the lineages for that. The modified versions where people have added additional things into it. Um, or their favorite techniques, um, and then the traditional techniques that Manung Ted taught that Anton taught. So, um, and many other systems got those same techniques as well. So it's not a unique hidden thing. Um, it's But a lot of it is around the perspective. So Terrell, I'm gonna say this because I wrote this in the wiki page. Um, by evidence alone, by the number of students that are practicing the grouping methodology versus those of the random or traditional methodology taught by Anchon, you can just make that data reference alone and say that the grouping methodology reaches more students in a much quicker and easier methodology of explaining. So please, this is not a discussion of which methodology is better it's a discussion of um the types so i came up in the non-grouping methodology so i have a bias or preference that way i like it um but i respect how the grouping methodology reaches more people um and is easier to practice for a lot of people and then there's the modified where i put the moringas and the monk calls and a few others where they did a few things that um, were brought in from maybe some other portions of training with other people um, or other influences themselves. But they're also non-grouped, right? They're still... Uh, that, that's correct. You can say grouped and non-grouped, but within the, the non-group, there's a, there's a splitting. And within the grouping, I think there's a splitting as well. So if you wanted to get even higher, you could say there's two, but it, I break it down to the three to give proper credit to those like the Trey Prasanna um, with, you know, Moringa and so forth, right? Um, they're trying to say that they pulled things in from outside, but it's very much Balintawak influence. So I want to give that proper um, credit for that, that lineage. Go ahead, Tim. So uh, actually, you know, we, Ty and I got to work, uh, to work with Drago Moringa. Very good. 
and recently I actually asked him a question because somebody was claiming to be his teacher and there, or his father's teacher. And he goes, no, we trained directly with Anchon and Anchon told me one day, your father's got the system. So that was, that was really cool. I, I can pull it up another time. That's so good. I, I, here's what I'm going to sit there and say, there are multiple lineages, more than two. There are two primary delivery systems. Yeah. So the, the word, in my opinion, if we're talking about, I think what you, you would have been better off saying, I think the real question wasn't lineage, more like what delivery systems are out there. Now, which lineage do you fall into? And because there's multiple grouping methods out there. Now, I'm going to share a chart that I have here. I pulled this up. Um, I redid it. This is, okay. This is the Balintwok family tree that Ted did for me. It was sitting on his basement table. Oh, I would love, to, oh, how do I get one of these? I came back for my second class later that, because I did, I did the weekend. It was eight hour session. So I got in my hotel. I went out, you know, because he was in Michigan. I'm in Buffalo. And I drove out. I, I did it over two days. Uh, I did two hours, had dinner, came back, went to do my next class. And <clears> but when I said, I go, man, I'd love to get something like that. He he got a slide ruler out and drew me the whole thing. So I put it, I did a digital copy of it, and I've got this here. And here's what my caveat is. This was the training groups. This is the family tree based on what was going on prior to his leaving the Philippines in the seventies. So anything that happened, anyone who's missing, which I do have every intention on updating this, um, but it's not one of my primary, um, it's not one of my primary uh, things to do. Um, and okay, here, so uh, real quick. Uh, thanks for a very good explanation. And I can see that there are three lineages from what you said. Okay. So um, I'm glad you said that about lineages because that word was not fitting with me. Either. No, no. I think. It's, captured it's, it. I think uh, all right. We'll take care. We'll take care of Jason. Uh, hey, I, think, I, I think much better if you just say delivery systems because let's talk about lineage. Mm -hmm. let's, let's get into lineage as we speak. Now, remember, there's people missing. So this is what I have. So uh, I'm going to look over. I'm going to actually, uh, I'm going to, let me see if I can do this here. We have Anshan, I'm going to do it on this one. We have Anshan Bakan. So uh, he had four primary groups at the time. Maranga, Villiasen, or actually not groups, students, I should say. Maranga, Villiasen, uh, Buat, and Delphine Lopez. Now, um, these three started their own clubs. Manung Ted never started a club. He just taught out of Anchon's. Okay. From there, um, Moncal was, I don't know how Moncal was with Maranga. I don't know if there was a student teacher thing. Remy was a student of Moncal's and then passed up to Moranga and eventually passed up to Anchon. Uh, which I know a lot of people were passed up to Anshan to do some training with, but I don't know if it was some training or, you know, you're no longer, there's nothing more I could do for you. So I don't know where, uh, where everyone rolls into. Villiasen, um produced uh, Yabez, <coughs> Dom Lopez. Dom Lopez got Mike Zimmer in Vancouver, and Pila Velez was Bobby Tabuada's teacher. Um from there and we know bobby worked with a whole bunch of these top names yes okay um so ted taught uh toro sanchez uh jim boy Hyfe. he had his detroit group and then there's my group now i list myself separately i didn't always went i i i I went for private lessons. I went every month for private lessons. And Rich and I would be there sometimes at the same time we do dinner or sometimes we taught a seminar afterwards or whatever the case may be. Um, but I had my own thing going here. I had my own students, you know. Um, I learned in Detroit, but we started a, 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 a Blintwalk branch here in Buffalo, which is why I always list myself separate. I'm still... 
under Ted's lineage because that's who I learned it from. Now, I do know there's some names missing, like, um, you know, uh, Nick Elazar is not here. You know, I don't know where size fits into. There's a whole bunch of people that, because the list was made when Aunt, when Ted was still in the Philippines. So, um, let me stop sharing. And I got another thing. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Nice. Jim, Jim Powers went there for 11 years. Is that right, Rich? Um. Know. Well, so he started in 96, and then I know that he had the stroke in 05. Um, and I do know that Jim was carrying on the instructions with many people in the Flint Club and, you know, working with the rest of us who were training with Manung Ted as well. So, um, but I do believe due to some of Jim's medical reasons, the last few years, he may not have been as attentive of a student as he was for the first. So the first four or five would have been consistent. And then five or six, I am will have to check the records, but I'm pretty sure getting up around seven, eight, nine, he would have been um, less consistent, but he was still teaching in the Flint area to those yeah. who were uh, coming to our clubs and working with us, um, including myself, including Mike, including uh, Ian Kershaw, um, Mike Power, Jim's son. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. I would have just sent that. To, um, I would just send that to you. Okay. I'll, I'll have to send something to someone. Um, here we go. Um, well, Jim told... Uh, you said he did twenty eight thousand dollars invested. Adds up after a while. And he was doing it three to four times a week with Ted. I know that he had a uh, year plus with Rocky before he started with Ted, and then I know that he um, was going down. Um, first few years at least once a week and then many times on Monday nights him and Kershaw would go down together <clears throat> and one or both of them would get an extra hour or split an extra hour um, when, did, you, when did Rocky start with uh, Manong Ted do you happen to know just curious yeah the Pretty. wall says February of 87. 87. Yeah, okay. Because even here, I know after a while, he, he started uh, slowing down in the later years as well. And he uh, well, lamented, well he, lamented wasn't, that he wasn't there when I was. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, Rocky was doing his own thing by the mid to late 90s. Um, the When I picked Remy up for the 87 camp from the airport, I went down, met Rocky. We went to the airport. And the reason we picked up Rocky is because, you know, I'd been trained and hadn't met um, Remy yet. So um, we picked, went to the airport. Um, I walked up with Rocky and he goes, who's this guy? And he goes, he's with me, hands me his bag. And the first thing he says to Rocky is, show me what Ted's showing you. <laughs> and what they were working on was a variation of a Bicidario and Sagittas. So, um, okay. So, uh, Terrell's got to take off. He, he didn't, he hoped he didn't have to, uh, take too much time. <laughs> Terrell, if you're still listening, I sent you that chart. Didn't have to worry about the screenshot, but I sent it to you <laughs> so you can see it directly. Um, thank you, Terrell. And, yep. take it uh, easy, Jim. <clears throat> yeah. And then when, and, uh, you know, I, he's got some great questions he asks. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to start a new... Th okay, so here's what I want everyone to do, especially because we're talking about modern East a lot more in general. Please send in questions. Um, you're welcome, Terrell. Please send in questions. Well, we're going to we're gonna probably do a couple Q&A 
shows where we can take a bunch of the questions that we've been asked off screen or whatnot and get into it. Because unfortunately, when you're doing something in a written platform, it doesn't always communicate the information properly. And, you know, um, there was a question recently about, you know, Remy's oldest student doing seminars and all this other stuff and a few things were said, but I think some things uh, maybe take a little out of context, which I definitely want to talk about this in the future, but, um, you know, so get your questions together and we will start doing more stuff of that nature. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, you, you oh. just said that Remy started asking about Balintwag. Let's get more into how does Balintwag affect modern? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you look at the basic 12 angles, they're, they're the same. Um, Balintwag counts them one way, modern East counts them another way. I believe this is due to uh, Remy's um, honoring of Anchon to say, don't teach it exactly the same and don't call it bullet. Uh, blend to walk if you're going to add to it or subtract from it. Um, so, um, and as Ted's, or Tim said, there's like, there was no disrespect meant between Remy and Enshot. Um, even when I asked him in the 80s, I said, well, are you the top stick fighter in the world? And he was like, no, I know some guys that can beat me <laughs> or could beat me at one time, right? So, um, and it wasn't false humility. He, he really meant that there were people out there. Um, so the the blocks without the brace, the um, the basics that you saw Remy do were a lot of the Balintowak motion. And when you saw him go more freestyle, it was a lot of the more Balintowak movement and style and timing based. Um, he chose the patterns or forms or drills for people to do to help give them things to practice with each other and do it in a controlled methodology so they knew exactly what to do and when to do it and then after that point they could um, move outside that box and come back to the box if they got confused or lost or were able to follow in time so um, six count Dicadina, you know, where you're just going through it. Somebody starts doing the thrust to make it 10. You don't know what to do. You stand back, do a bad block parry, give them a 12, right? Go right back into the six count portion. Um, so it allowed for a good basis for his system. But if you look at the five special strikes, you look at the other things that he was putting in, those were his trainings from his family system and from others that he was bringing in to add to it to make it more vibrant and cover more area, but also to give people an opportunity to learn. Um, I asked him once, I said, gee, there's like three different versions of this form being practiced out on the camp floor. Which one do I need to learn? And he goes, learn all. <laughs> and I said, why? Because, you know, young punk. And he's like, well, put your back against the wall. Can you do, do the backward stepping one now? No. Okay, put your left shoulder against the wall. Can you do the one that has to go to the left? No. So you have to learn these variations and understand. So. Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay, okay, so oh, since we brought this up, and and when Terrell watches this later, yeah, I'll I'll share this with you. Here are the Blintwalk and Modern Arnie's angles of attack. Personally, I think Remy did a better job, and I'll tell you why. Well, no, no, let me let me let me get into it. Um, Remy, Rem, Modern. We talked about this before. Modern Arnie's at the lower levels is really about teaching people how to apply Filipino concepts of combat to more practical self-defense. Balintawak Eskrima, stick dueling against another trained opponent. Uh, right, wrong, or indifferent? Yeah, Balintawak is stick dueling. Okay. Now, what I liked what Remy did from a 
learning pro platform, not using the Abecedario two-person set that Anshan used for. So, like, if you look at, um, if you look at, in Balintwak, in, in the original system of Balintwak, you had four levels. Level one was Abecedario. Level two was um, Sagittas. Level three was Caratus. Level four was Quintata. Now, level one is ABC Dero, your angles of attack in numerical order in a two-person moving set. Mm -hmm. So it's like, like for those who've done Kempo, it's like a two-man set. It's a two-person kata. It's not a kata. It's, I'm just, it's just, you know, uh, you're, you're teaching someone to be a pad drill. You know, uh, I feed you attack, you block, you come back to me. So I'm holding the pads while you're hitting. Sagittas is the random feed of that. Caratus is when both people play and try to win. Quintata is when you have a level of mastery over somebody. Uh, more or less, right? Yeah. Okay. But to understand it as well, somebody who's been trained for a little bit and could be in the early part of Quintata, or excuse me, the early part of Caratus, could Quintata somebody who's a total newbie, right? Right, because it's subjective on who you're at, you know. So Correct, yes. Uh, so now... On the right is the modern East angles of attack on the left. Um, what Remy did, which I thought was very good, he, he reversed some things. But what I, but in, in, when you look at this, they're all the same damn angles of attack. They're just taught in a different numerical order. And I blew this, actually. Um, or, or is this the WMA? And I have so many versions of these things. <laughs> you know, uh, let, me, let me check my folder real quick because I have that here. Uh, let me, okay, you know what? Let me use this one instead. Okay. Yeah, let's let's do this one right here. So, no, I still screwed up the leg shots. We're not going to look at the legs. We'll ignore the legs. Don't look at the legs. <laughs> it's like some of the bodybuilders. Look at my arms. I got to use biceps. I've got no legs. We're skipping oh. legs today. Yeah. Sorry, Ty. Okay. <laughs> Hey, so anyways, I'm going to do this one. I'll go back to the first one. So I messed up on that chart and the legs. But let's look at everything except for the legs. All right. In modern, Erin Balintwag, number one, both have the same number one. Yep. And we're talking sequence. They're all the same angles of attack. So one is the forehand, two is the backhand. In Balintwag, three is a backhand here where that's the forehand of modern and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Forehand is four, backhand is modern. Five, they both do the same belly poke. Here we go. Modern, six is a forehand shoulder poke, where it's a backhand shoulder poke in Balintwak, and then vice versa here. Forehand eye poke, backhand eye poke, you know. So if you look at most of the angles, except for one and two and five and 12, the rest of the numbers are flipped. Now, when you do the two-person set, the Abecedario, in Balintwak, the sequence makes perfect sense based on your stepping pat, your footwork pattern that goes with that. But if you're just doing the angles of attack, just feed an angle, step back, feed another angle. I like Remy's format platform better because forehands are more popular than backhands in general. He does, all, except for the legs, all the pair, they're all taught in pairs, and except for the legs. They all start with a forehand and followed with a backhand. So it's good, using a Kempo term, category completion. Um, you know, so I like that because we're talking about teaching an art for self-defense versus a fighting art or a two-person set. And um, I think I just said that, Chris. Yeah, the, the yeah the modern, the modern and the Balintwak thrusts are opposite of each other, right? If that's what you're saying, that's exactly what I just what I just said there. Yep. Unless you're just, yeah. So same angles though. So it's just a different delivery, so just different order. And I think that the order, I, I think part of it maybe Remy changed it to be different, but I also think if he would have kept the leg shots the same as the the little original blunt walk, then all of the pairs it would have been forehand first, backhand second, and I think it would have been a much better platform isolating individual angles of attack in a self-defense, defensive tactics type platform. Okay, and there we go. But in this, if you look at this, to me, this is huge evidence on that modern Arnis, um, modern Arnis uh, 
is influenced by Balenswak. And Chris says that I am perfect. Oh, no, I described him perfectly. <laughs> Damn, I, I was hoping that I was perfect. Thanks for the clarification. You got it, Chris. You got it. Um, so let's, let's, I'm going to, okay. Let, um, so we're coming up on an hour and a half. Let me hit you with a couple hard hitting questions. Okay. Are I'll you just... learning Balint Walk by doing modern Arnis? No. <laughs> How could that be? <laughs> that, the, isn't Tabby Tabby Balint Walk? No. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Because Balint Walk's there... not Tappy Tappy. Okay. And so those who are doing Tappy Tappy and they're doing wonderful at it. Well, let's throw it out this way. Here we go. Let's. I, I'm going to hit you with a left turn. Right, is there more than one version of Tappy Tappy? Boom. Yes. So, is there not a Balintwak version of Tappy Tappy? Traditional Balintwak doesn't have any sets or patterns other than a B scenario. Is there a Balintwak version of Tappy Tappy? No, not, not, not for me. No, there is. Where you feed oh. and counter. It's the Sagi- it's the Sagitas, right? Yeah, yeah. Sagitas okay. slash okay. slash Kuretis, baby. So, solo Bastan is the semi sparring off a of single Sinwali. You would go into budding and then you would feed Remy Jelly would feed Sagitas, skipping ABC area completely. And that was Tappy Tappy back in the day. He used solo Bastan sparring, semi sparring drill as the platform to get us there. Correct. Okay, but the new modern Arnie's Tappy Tappy doesn't necessarily cover that material, does it? No, but it does get you to get your twirl blocks down, which are important. Hey, dot two, tad late. Uh, we'll have to catch up. Replay. Looking forward to hearing it. Okay, good. So Thank wait a you. second. You mean the the newer the last stages of Tapi Tapi before Professor died? Are you talking about them not doing uh, Abisadario, Sagitas, and and Caritas type things? Are you talking to him or me? Either one of you, because you were the talking yeah. about. Okay. Well, I mean, okay. So the 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 Tappy Tappy that we now know today as the whole is really more Solobaston semi sparring, left on right. Hmm. Whereas the original Tappy Tappy was the Sagitas portion, no footwork. That was just Remy would take Solo Bastan, get us into, he did the Solo Bastan semi sparring to get us into doing Tappy Tappy and then break out into Solo Bastan. The new Tappy Tappy, he got away from, he got away from the old Tappy Tappy a long time ago. That's weird because. Yeah. In Texas, at least, we we did we started with some of the cool things that he that are more like the the more recent stuff. But he made sure that everybody at camps in Texas went back to doing um, starting out with Abisadario and then shortening it to to a few few strikes that were set, and then starting to getting people into random. So that would be Sagitas, right? So in the eighties, he backed away from that for a while. Oh, for a while, okay. But you know, remember Texas was catching yeah. up in the nineties, yeah, so I yeah, guess yeah. he did all of that then. Okay. Yeah. So, but there is definitely a different portion. There was a spot that it was much more akin to Balintwak than. Okay. And and the problem with Tappy Tappy in the later eras is there may be some elements in there, but so much of the left on right, there's so much emphasis on the left and right. It takes all that time away from the other stuff. So you'll only see yep. it became the uh, the twelve six three drill or twelve three six drill or whatever five, I don't know whatever the heck they called it one two five seven one one two five seven one of yeah. them one two well, five one, seven two, twelve, five, yeah. 12 one, two, five, yep. 12, you that know. one two yeah 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 so um, but that was kind of an afterthought ish type thing I mean Remy was doing it but he wasn't doing it a lot a lot. He really was doing more of the Sinwali based program versus the Balintwak based program. You know, um, I, I mean, because there's so, so much emphasized on the left on right. And none of the left on right Remy did was on the same, uh, would be a, a platform that I would consider anything similar to Balintwak. 
the closest might have been something that maybe Moncal had done. I was going to say, yeah. Oh, well, a move or two is nothing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, you you know, you can sit there and say, oh, look, he did a judo throw. He's not doing <laughs> judo. You know, so, you know, I mean, you can sit there, oh, he's doing balance walk. How do you tell? He's doing the 12 angles of attack. Really? Well, I, so when, when I have a ton on my hand, doesn't mean I'm doing Japanese martial arts either. So I get what you're saying. Well, I, it was hilarious. I, well, I don't know, hilarious. During the protest, um, bro, protest in Buffalo, there's a guy who's a student of, or a friend or student of Doug Pierre in the South, in the Southern tier from here. And he's reaching up. Who's teaching the police? Um, our niece. It's, it's polluting the art. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said he saw a police officer with two sticks in his hands, which I couldn't find any footage of it elsewhere. And I talked to our police people. They would never put two batons in people's hands. Never. And I go, well, what did you see? Well, they did an angle one. DHS teaches two batons. Hmm? DHS does not teach dual, dual batons either. Yeah. And and he goes, well, what did he do? He did an angle number one. And, well, I mean, that's the same. I'm like, are you kidding? Why? Do <laughs> Everyone does that caveman type swing. Hell, Mark Denny calls it the caveman because everyone does the swing. So, mm -hmm. so just because something is similar doesn't mean it is the same. Like I said, there was a, a back in the 80s, it would be definitely, I mean, Remy was doing Sagitas without footwork. Yeah. And he would do Sol to get us there. So, like, like tonight, I I was teaching, we were doing a combination on the one test. So the combination was cross or cross. Well, what got us there? Well, we led with a front leg snap kick or we did a jab to as that entry. Mm -hmm. and then, the core, then the core move was cross or cross. And then if there was a follow-up, it was whatever. So the core move would have been the Sagitas, a light, a light version of it. But then to get us there, Remy used solo baston semi sparring as the entry into that. So, but the, you definitely the later era people didn't have that. Hmm. Well, now I'm glad I'm extra glad that I was in Texas because we got whole sections of that uh, during camps and stuff. It was not just a, a temporary thing. We do whole sections on that kind of stuff, which yeah, I enjoyed. I, you know, it just a lot of people, I mean, it was, I think it was good material, but I think Remy had a hard time teaching it to people. And that's why he, right. and that's I why he kept that. asking people like Rich and myself or Rocky, who was around, around Ted and say, Hey, what did Ted teach you? <laughs> you know, I mean, that was a common question. So, all right. Um, here we go. Modern Arnis is tactically superior to Balintwak because Balintwak doesn't have a live hand. <laughs> now, now the person who said this, who I'm not going to throw under the bus. <laughs> okay. Unless you've heard this stuff, you know, but the person who said this one said, Remy said that, which I, I'm going to call it right now. Bull shit. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've never heard Remy. Remy was the one that opened up the door for me to train with Ted. He goes, if you want to learn real stick fighting, train with Ted Buat. I'm like, I thought I was learning real stick fighting, but whatever. So, and I've got, I've got a comment for all of our brothers and sisters on the grouping side of the modern, of the Blintwalk family. But if you don't use the line, I will tell me your thoughts on Blintwalk not having a live hand. Well, the left hand is the quarterback. So if you're not using your left hand, you're not calling the play. You're not setting it up. So the left hand for Ted through um, the instructions he got from Anshan manages, monitors, and delays. The, so, three, the holy trinity for our <clears throat> for for us, the holy trinity that we were taught from the moment we walked in, the live hand manages, monitors, and delay. And what Bobby always talks about, he only does two. This is the feeler. And this is the keeler. There you go. <laughs> and I, of course, I had to up him one. I go, yeah. Well, this is the grabber, and this is the stabber. And he chuckled. But um, it took me five years to figure out that saying. So, keep going, my friend. Keep going. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I don't believe any art is superior to another. It depends upon the size of the fight. 
in the dog of the person who's in the fight, okay? Um, so, on, and then on any given day, somebody could be having a bad day and somebody could be having a good day and things happen. Somebody gets lucky. Um, somebody gets unlucky and slips, doesn't matter, right? Um, that being said, the one of the optimal things that most Filipino systems eventually train is moving both hands. And the Blintowak side of it starts out with moving both hands all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, it doesn't even start you here, it starts you with bringing that left hand out right behind your cane. So when you go to manage, otherwise it's just a wrist turn to get on that stick versus having to come all the way out and cover that distance. Um, so therefore it's not speed, it's timing mm -hmm. for how you put your hand on someone's uh, or your opponent or their weapon. So <clears throat> to say that they don't have a live hand, um, I'm sure there are practitioners out there who have poor live hands, okay? Uh, but I don't know of any lineages that ignore the live hand. Yeah, I mean, so if you look, right, you know, you uh, some lineages use the term pakgang block, right? Right. Right with that, you're using both hands, right? You yeah. cannot do it without both hands. Um, or even, and I'll jump in with, because uh, you guys know, you guys, obviously, I did not train with uh, Menong Ted. I've trained with you guys a little bit. I've trained with, luckily, a lot of different uh, lens walk styles. But looking at the Moncal stuff from Nocopa from our friend Master Reno, right? Yep. Lots of yeah, that's a good guy. There. Yep. Lots of handwork there. Um, I can't think of anybody that didn't have lots of handwork unless sometimes somebody's doing a feeder during some groupings in there and they're and they're maybe they're going fast and not concentrating on their hand. But that's the feeder. That's not the person learning. Well, let's talk about the big one. Unless you already didn't say it. Here we go. So, Grouping number one is lifting and clearing, right? Right. So how do you lift and clear without using your hands? Uh, yes, it's the force. That's this, right. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. This is not the DKI of the Arnis world. <laughs> the Scribble world. FMA so, world. <clears throat> yeah. Luke, the, I am your father. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. So, so the live hand. Okay, I, I know when I trained, the live hand was probably, I mean, I thought, I, okay, listen, as far as a modern guy goes, I thought, man, my live hand is great because I looked at karate and taekwondo, how I came up with the people around me. When we when they would start picking up weapon and train, we'd cross train. You're like, damn, they don't know shit. They're not doing this at all. Of course, when I was doing kicks with them, they were like, you don't know shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm training with you guys. Because you're supposed to help critique me, and I critique you. You know, so I've been in both you. those classes. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, as we went up, I mean, because you know, I I was fortunate. I was with a crew of multi style multi style people, and we cross trained together. But you know, the the thing I oh my god, when people pick up weapons, they they're they're the there is you either have a live hand or a dead hand, and most people who have not done weapon systems, the live hand becomes the weapon hand. It's like no 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 no. <laughs> this is the live hand. This keeps you alive for multiple. One, it could be a sacrifice. Worst case scenario. Secondly, the managed modern delay. Um, yeah. So I just, you know, when I when I was with Ted, I couldn't believe the increase mm -hmm. of the efficiency of my live hand. It was just huge, 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 huge. Um, if you're what? doing a beast scenario to a total new beginner, and you're not guiding their stick because you as the instructor may not know or feel comfortable from the instructor's side. So when you reach out with the puño and they're doing their block and then you step back and you don't drag them with you and give them the number two, you give them the backhand, um, <clears throat> you end up with it looking like maybe the left hand is not there. Mm -hmm. So if you're only looking at that from a mediocre beginner instructor or whatever, who's not doing that movement, um, then yes, I could see where somebody may, could make that comment. But you need to look past that onesie twosies and you need to look past 
and look at the seniors of the art. You need to look at the, the better practitioners of the art um, and the better instructors because better instructors can do things that some of the better practitioners can't. It all depends upon where their skill sets are at. Okay. <clears throat> so it is getting close to that time. So um, my question to you, I got a couple quick questions here. So we've asked a whole bunch of things. So where do you think, like, the biggest evidence on, um, what, what, what would you say the one thing, if you had to pick one thing that Blintwock influenced modern more than anything else, what do you think that one thing would be? Well, to me, and this is from my perspective, it's the, the blocks. And because without getting that block in place, you can't get your hand on the opponent or their opponent's weapon. And then you can't begin to manipulate it. So if you don't have a solid block there, then you um, can't accomplish those tasks. Because that's what opens up everything else. Okay. There is a lot of other areas, but for me, that's the one area that I would call. Okay. And um, let me look at something here. I'm trying to pull some things together for this. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. Okay. Um, for me, I think the biggest thing, and it's a byproduct of the training, not a direct thing, is that I think what Remy did Mm -hmm. Lint walk the range is so close, so close, <laughs> it forces a lot of stick on stick contact. Yes, not exclusive because obviously, with the pokes, we can do a lot of pairing with one hand and hitting mm -hmm. the wrist and stuff, but it forces that stick on stick contact a lot. And I think what Remy did is saw how that could increase the lively, the longevity of people training. Yes. And he sat there and said, okay, I'm going to go stick on stick instead of stick on hand. Because why do people go to karate instead of our uh, of FMA? Because you bash the person's hands, you can't work for a week or two, and <laughs> you can't provide for your family. But let's see what Mr. Cribs says, because I didn't get a chance. Uh, Ty, can you see that better? But it's my yeah, so Mike says, when I would train with Ted, I would block in the beginning with my empty hand because I couldn't get my stick up to block uh, his strike, which makes sense. He would say, Mike, why do you block with your empty hand? I said, so I don't get a hit in the head. He said, then you will go home with a broken hand and head. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. And then uh, angles of attack. That's a good one. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good one. Um, I want to see what did Jeremy say here. That's a good one, too. I thought he was going to a live hand. Um, the live hand is very important, but to set up the live hand, you got to have the block. To set up your attacks for the for your angles, you got to have that block. So I, also, I, took, yeah. I took a step back and said, "What is what is my entry point? Is I got to have that that window in front of me?" Yeah, you can have superior timing and, and avoid that, but for the beginners and everything else to get them moving, they have to feel comfortable behind that block so that okay. they can then move forward. I, I think Remy did a lot of live hand already because the family system was bladed. Yes, that's true. You know, and then Jeremy said noted. Uh, I, yeah. could, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I think you could walk that thread in lots of different directions and find these overlaps. So the block certainly you have to set up. There's the live hand, right? There's the managing. For me, I find a lot of the connection from the clipping to the grabbing that Remy would do. And it really depends on, you know, what your emphasis is. And of course, Mongol yes. encouraged that. But that I find is a, is a nice bridge in and why he asked for people to use those giant wampin sticks because that changes your clipping into something else. Oh, here's a question. Is there grabbing in Balint Walk? <sighs> you will grab <laughs> the opponent's hand or you will lock them up only when you're doing your finishing move. But it's, as Ty said in a recent uh, Just One Thing, it's not a committed hand position it's it, you put your hand on there for trapping hands you kick that there you can pull it down and trap them down you can pin them but if they step back you can pull your hand back so um there is but it's a qualified 
See, I, I was going to say, I, 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 uh, we do I practice think, grabs to counter the grabs because grabs well, do. Well, I was going to say this too. Here, first of all, Ted told us don't rely on grabbing. Correct. He didn't say that it, no, and he'd also say, but grabs work. But he didn't want us to rely on, which is different than saying that they don't exist. Also, a bunch of the troncas, a mm -hmm. bunch of the disarms. Hey, the disarms, if you're not grabbing something and some of these disarms, the stick's not coming out. Correct. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of management. And right. I, it just, you didn't, he just didn't want to block grab hit all the time because there's mm -hmm. ways to work around that grab. And, you know, the nice thing, the one thing I like about the, okay, so Ted know, or uh, not Ted, Ty knows, and you know, um, I have definitely cross trained into the grouping methodology. Mm -hmm. I think the groupings have a lot of good things to say, to offer. And here is our family member again. Hello, sir. Um, Hello. So the um, the um, I think the the grouping method has its place. Unfortunately, both system both adult, both delivery systems have their pros and cons. The cons to doing the scenario-based training that we did, it is hard. It takes a lot longer for people to get on board. Correct. You have, to, you have to be more committed to the training because you don't get those warm fuzzies. It's work. Where the groupings are fun and you can get fairly quick, fairly fast. The difference, though, is with a lot of the grouping people, they're going for speed so much, they're not working timing and or strategy it's all about going fast it's about putting the putting the pedal to the metal and there's a lot of grabs and all these other things that are that are in balint walk that are missed during the grouping because of the rate of speed they're going so i love doing the i think the benefit of both is there and i think there's a lot of timing and strategy but when you're doing a grouping system you're not working strategy it's just really a pad drill on steroids because the, the, the driver as Bobby would always say, he's just feeding, he's feeding a sequence and you're responding to it. Just like I'm holding boxing mitts up to you. And yeah, you can go a little random and stuff here and there, but there's a lot of things that we do in the, in the ungroup methodology that we just don't get the opportunity in the group system because of how a lot of the grouping people emphasize speed, not necessarily exploration. I got a question on, along those lines for <clears throat> for Rich then, um, yeah. and I'm going to actually pose my thought, and then I wanted to hear your thoughts. So, so one of the things is I was looking through a lot of what Remy showed us with some of the toppy toppy uh, sequences, inserts. What do you want to call them? Mm -hmm. A lot of times he ended up making those uh, depending on who he was working with, he would change them up, and he didn't care. So I, it occurred to me that maybe he was sort of doing a hybrid, right? He was doing a, a, a scenario in his head. It didn't go the way he wanted. He didn't care. He could, you know, he could do um, live what he wanted to do and give somebody, people, some a nice chunk of material to work on that was pre-programmed for that time. And then maybe it would be different next. So my thought was maybe he was doing that on purpose. Any thoughts along those lines, benefits, negatives, or other interpretations? Yeah, I've seen Remy do that numerous times where either part of the group of the crowd or an individual is having a specific problem, picking it up or learning it, or is just not able to make the move physically. So then he switches it so they can do it in a slightly different manner um, <clears throat> and then continue moving and playing. Because a lot of what he was after was not only are you learning, but are you having fun. Mm -hmm. And if you're having fun, you'll come back and learn more. <clears throat> if you come back and learn more, then you're still having fun, right? Um, so um, I, I think part of it was um, when he was moving at speed and he would change things up, yeah, that was just reaction. Mm -hmm. but, if, but if he was moving relatively slow or working with people, then he was doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I was at one of the camps and working with somebody and we were doing some of the tappy tappy drill and they said, Rich, because we were talking back and forth, I can't get this to work on you. And I just said, I am so sorry. We're too busy talking. I'm not concentrating. Mm -hmm. And they said, what do you mean? 
I said, I'm just reacting. And so when I put my hand on yours and you go to move, I just rotate around and pull my hand back instinctively for my training. I said, so let me give you some inputs that you can practice with. And so I went into my teaching mode, which then allowed me to create a pose, a stance that I could make those type of moves for me without affecting my overall training. So, um, yeah, sometimes you just make those naturally, but when you catch them, right. it's good to, uh, to work around them. I think uh, the nice thing was if you were paying attention when he was doing that, because remember he was pretty good about teaching you extra stuff. I think mm -hmm. uh, since I was always on the lookout for that, when he was doing that kind of problem solving, in my mind, he was at least giving me examples of problem solving. Uh, yes. and I like to think he did it on purpose. So he wasn't just teaching us material, but also um, uh, ability to do our own, you know, teach us how to think essentially, right? Critical thinking, but in a, in a, in a FMA mindset. Yeah. Um, so there's a quick story about Anchan, Ted, and another student. So <clears throat> um, Anchan and is watching Ted working with this guy and he goes, I don't know this one. So Anchan steps in, shows him the counter, and then he steps back and the guy does the counter working with Ted. Ted counters the counter, gets somebody who steps in, teaches them the next move, gets through it. And then after about the third one, he steps back and leans into Ted and he says, you're on your own, kid, because he hadn't taught him the counter to that move yet. So Ted knew, I just have to use my basics. I just got to do what I need to do to not get hit there. Um, so that mindset comes down from at least one or more of his instructors mm -hmm. to do that problem solving, give them the bits and pieces, give them the, um, the building blocks, and then from there, allow them to try and solve it in a working condition versus a, a life or death condition. Since uh, since Dato already touched on the uh, <laughs> on one of the mean questions, I don't know if you guys already covered this. One of the things I've heard over the years, which I don't uh, subscribe to, but I'm going to ask the question anyway: um, Was modernis created to defeat Balintuar? <laughs> <laughs> See, um, you don't get to be the only one asking the bad questions, Tim. I'm having problems with my damn microphone standing up. Every time I turn around, it's like I bump into it and it starts falling over. I'm like, ah. That's why I keep so, going off here. I don't think so. Um, what would you say to that person asking that question to help them understand or or to point them in uh, what they could, you know, could get from thinking about that? It, in other it, words, they must have had a reason to ask it. And then, you know, that can actually point you to some better understanding uh, across the board, not just, you know, hey, this is not what this is not right. OK, stop there. Right. So a lot of people don't want to train in the second best system, or the second best school <laughs> or the third best or the fourth best. They want to be in the best to know that they're what they're paying for is the value and they're getting the best they can get. Right. Um, the, the next thing around that is um, back to the comment of anybody on any given day can probably beat someone else unless the disparity is so far, right? Total newbie and somebody's a very trained practitioner, right? Because um, somebody has a bad day, they twist an ankle, they, they slip, whatever the case may be, the other person may score the points or get the knockout or whatever. Um, so there are techniques that modernese has and particularly there's a, a couple of angles that traditional blint lock doesn't cover very well you have to adjust your body positioning and uh, attack it with a slightly different um, piece but it's not something that's traditionally taught as the primary goal and that is figure eight so the figure eight up where you're striking from the heels up across the body on, on both sides. Hmm. Those, those up diagonal strikes are just not what most people are used to hmm. from the traditional Balinta walk side. Now, as soon as you realize, oh, that stick's coming up, I just have to lean back, meet it force to force, or come behind it and pass it, right? Then that puts them 
back in, stepping back in and feeding a good backhand. So you've got a good shield wall in front of you. They can come back and then you can re-engage in the game that you're looking at. Um, probably goes both so, ways though too, right? Yeah, because I, mean, I would say that uh, Modern East probably doesn't deal too well with something like a, a, a really masterful sublique, right? <laughs> correct, yes. And yeah, th that was known as one of the main knockouts, yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would say that um, Remy did, Remy, okay, Remy had two things. He had Modern Arnis, and then he had his, him. I, why do I go, one of the reasons why I go by Praces Arnis is that it's more of what Remy taught me than what he taught the masses. Because Remy did stuff that he taught the masses, and then he did personal consumption. And I learned a lot of that because of the concentration. I mean, I did, I did his art full time. And I think he didn't create a system to beat modern Arnis, or I mean, Blintwok. He created, I mean, because he loved Blintwok people. He tried to create something that was going to be as as strong as possible. Oh, look who's on board with us today. Oh, Reno. wow. Excellent. Hey, Reno. Hey, Reno. How you doing, brother? Nice. Great is a, a break. Linu <laughs> Gal. Linu Gal. Okay, cool. So I love Reno. I'm, I'm glad to hear from you, bro. This is awesome, um, yeah. I, You know, the thing here is... I'm giving away secrets there, Reno. <laughs> uh, the, the, the the thing is this that Remy created a self defense system first. Yes. He taught us how to do the higher end material, which in modern days is more drill building than anything else. Skill development. Right. Uh, because who's gonna do all this shit? You know, mm -hmm. I mean who you know, you're not gonna have a trained fighter to go up against. Hey, I'm glad you're doing well, bro. Mm -hmm. Um he, if anything, he would, he would, okay, let's put it this way. If he was going to build an art to create, uh, to, to, uh, to beat a system, he wouldn't limit it to Balintwak. Right. <laughs> and you, hey, we're all doing well, bro. We're going to, hey, doing we, great. Thank you, Reno. Reno, yeah. we're going to be doing a series on Balintwak. I'm officially asking, would you like to be part of the show in the future? Say yes. Please say yes. Say, <laughs> say uh, oh, oh. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, no, he was trying to make the you know the best system he could make for the for the people that he was teaching it to, and also for his own self, right? Yeah. So correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, his fighting expression was to beat everybody. Yeah, <laughs> all the time. Okay, it was. It, he would not just sit. Like I said, he had too many good friends in Balintwak, you know. Um, and oh, look at this! Boom! Why not? Why not? Exactly. You, that's right. What he's saying is he should be on the show. That's so right. we'll make that happen, Excellent. bro. And what else Excellent. you got? Sure. Yes. Excellent. Mabuti. All right. Our first uh our first non direct family member, Balintwak member, you know, on the show. Because Rich is family family. He's inner circle. <laughs> <laughs> you're the you're the you're the one about on the outside, you know. Um so um so when I hear that, now here's what I'm gonna say. And it go. This is a two way street. There's so much in modern Ernest that could that could combat combat Balintwak and vice versa. But the key here's the secret. This is what people don't have. If you don't know both sides of the equation, <laughs> you can't apply it. Right. And there's Mr. Wolf. Thanks for uh, saying hello. That brought oh, excellent. All three of us. So that actually leads me to another question, if you don't mind, Tim. Oh, go ahead. So <clears throat> there was one. I had one. I had a list of questions. Tim already covered a bunch of them. But then this older one actually ties right into that. So if you know both sides of the equation, and you've trained both sides, and I know Tim has as well, and I've got some exposure. But what I was, since this is, you know, you're, you're our, our guest here, the main thing I want to ask you is, what are some of your favorite similarities between the blitz walk you've done and modern? And what are some of your favorite differences and why? <laughs> That will help um, me understand cool things so I can beat everybody. Not so, me, because I'm not going to teach you that secret move. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me start with the differences. Um, the, the range, um, you're engaged where most people would consider grappling range, mm -hmm. you know, elbows and knees and hooks. Um, with sticks, 
for a blunt walk a lot of times. But you're shifting and angling your body and your hips and knees to get a full power strike, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then even if you do come out to what our medium range is, then that's pretty much everybody else's short corridor range, right? And then our largo range is most people's medium. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so those range differences allows you to close in on people who are not used to training the weapon at that range okay. where okay. you're more comfortable in that range. So you've taken them out of their element, right? Okay. Um, similarities. Um, the similarities of being able to just hold a stick first, learning the basics there, learning getting both hands moving, um, the block check counter motion, the trapping hands motion, the just those basics alone gets you moving, gets your feet working, gets your hips working. Because when you just try to line up, you're like, oh, they got a forehand coming in. So you turn and block and you turn your hip, your hips and shoulders to match, but you've created a nice A-frame, right? And you've got a nice little um your your body's parallel with their, their stick. So that's a good framework to begin with. And those similarities is a good basis for people to start moving and training. Um, and which is why some people say, oh, but I am doing this. No, you're not, because there's still the differences, right? Um, so. Okay. So let me, uh, Mike's got something to say here. Let me go to this. All right, what he's got here. I would say first train modern ace and then learn balloon to walk. It teaches you how to strike and you get used to the stick in your hand. Balloon to walk has a ton of things, uh, things to it. Uh, I think balloon to walk is just over the head of people, uh, uh, over the head of a person picking up a stick. Yeah. So if they're totally brand new, he's saying you might yeah. want to. And then I was glad that the black before, yeah. So, so yeah. I mean, I mean, Makes sense. okay. This, this, this is it. Okay. What is your mission statement in training? That's gonna, that's gonna define all of this. So, I'll be upfront. Um, if it wasn't for who I am and where I was in my life, and I did balance walk before I did anything else, um, without having the visual index to understand what the goal was i may have quit you know uh the group met or the ungroup methodology it's boring it's very boring i mean uh let's talk okay so let's talk about uh dan anderson he told me he went to he did a couple classes with ted he did his program with ted and he goes to me tim what did you uh what what did uh how long did uh ted keep you on sublig Oh, I don't know, maybe five, 10 minutes. I mean, we're always brushing it up. Every technique he tells me, he teaches me, he always makes sure I take it to the next level because my level of understanding and execution changes over time. Okay. But yeah, so maybe five, 10 minutes. Tim, I was on there for 45 minutes. Okay, now Remy was doing a similar move near the end of his life, mm -hmm. like you call the outside sublig. Yep. Very similar. And if you already had that, which I'm not sure if Dan did or did not, going into this, this you would have had that base structure to pick up on. But, you know, um, but if I didn't have what I had, I may have, I'm, it, it's rough. I mean, and here's the other thing too is, once again, what's our mission statement? If we're talking about being able to protect ourselves, Balint Walk is not what I'm looking for. Because I'm not dealing with a bunch of Train stick wheeling mm -hmm. components out there. This is not big trouble in little in little China, and we're not dealing with raiding in the streets. <laughs> Although it would be pretty cool. But <laughs> we're talking about. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, we're not talking the start of Mortal Kombat. We're talking about real life scenarios, and that's people punching, kicking, picking up blades, two by fours, bottles. Can you take your techniques from Balintwak? and apply those two scenarios, sure you can. But is that the gist of what you're doing in Balintwak? And the, the primary thing is it's two 
trained opponents dueling, like fencing, like kendo, fill in the blank. So I would hands down with all the things I've done, everything, my modern, okay, look at Kombatan, Balintwak, uh, Dikiti Tertia, Kuntao, Sikaran, uh, Panatukin, and all these other things. First and foremost, I would never give up my modern training. Never, ever, ever, because it's probably the most useful of all the systems I've ever trained in real life, everyday situations. And, you know, someone's going to point out, well, I did this one move. Okay. How many moves do you have? If you've got 40, 50, 100, 200 moves, and only one or two of them apply to real life scenarios, then why are you training? If you're doing it for fun, hey, no problem. But if you're doing it to protect yourself, which that's my goal. Why do I do dos manos, dis, uh, dos manos stick techniques? Because I'm dealing with baseball bats, shovels, and axe handles. And I don't see someone blocking, doing a one-handed block like we do in blint walk or unbraced in modern, all this other stuff, against a baseball bat being swung at your head. Now, if you can do it, that's fine. But do your students have that ability as well? So I would always say modern first. <clears throat> um, do you have something to say about that? Anybody? Anybody? I'm gonna. I'm. I see some questions. I wanna. I wanna. Well, <clears throat> yeah. I get asked this question of, do I teach modern? And I do teach modern. Um, and um, my police officers that I train, mm -hmm. I teach them the modern arnis. I don't. Later we can work on the blend to walk, but to get them what they're looking for, to get them more comfortable with certain things, we do that. A few of them will show up. They'll come with me with a couple scenarios where they had some failures in their own personal training, and we'll work one or two classes on that, and then they'll go away again. And people are like, well, Rich, you're not making any money off it. I said, no, but they're alive. <laughs> and, and they may protect you someday. Right, yeah. So I, you know, if I can concentrate on what they're looking for, get them to what they need to do the practice of it on their own, then, hey, I'm okay with that for them. So, yeah, I still teach modern East. I still think it's a wonderful system. Um, okay. All right, so let's go through a couple of things. And, 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 and with that, and even and, and my Cribs talks about this. Here we go. I was glad I had a black belt before um, I went to TED. I think that any of the systems of Balintwak out there – if you were a modern earnings person and cross trained in, you were going to get so much benefit on all of the systems. It yep. will look at things completely different. Yep. Uh, and also it'll come up with new reference points that you could use your modern earnings moves on people that have never seen it because the blint walk people would be surprised at some of the things coming their way. Let me just, yep. it's not just a, Oh, modern blint walk will help modern turn them into real stick fighters. No, <laughs> No, there's a lot of material there. Well, you know what's going to turn someone a real stick fighter? Actually training. But that's another topic. Uh, so the next one. I didn't learn uh, shorter striking when I studied in the 90s with you. Okay. Yeah, Chris, we were doing the modern our knees. The, the shorter striking was the blunt walk training that we were doing. So that would have been the late 90s, and that would have been off to the side without the color belt. So, so basically you had the – basic membership if you would have went up to the premium package <laughs> they would have taught you the extra material we'll cover that in fma professional <laughs> later uh here's, here we go blunt walk changed uh my life and the way i look at the whole and uh and our whole club in flint yep heard that many times from the flint members let me see here we go uh blunt walk is all we did for at least four years in the in the class Every Sunday for two hours. Cool, cool, cool. Two hours every Sunday, at least four years. And wait for it. Here we go. Boom. Mike <laughs> agreed with me. All right, there we go. <laughs> Ring the bell. Write the calendar. <clears throat> that's, the, that's a wrap then, right? That's a wrap. <laughs> there we go. Wrap. Boom. Um, okay, so let's 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 recap. Modern Arnis was not created to, to defeat Balintwak. That's nonsense. Right. Uh, Balintwak is where a lot of the live hand techniques may have came from along with some other systems. Definitely the angles of attack were influenced. Um, Remy did a lot of Balintwak coming up 
and did a hybrid program as he went. But Tappy Tappy is not the full breadth of Tappy Tappy of what we know today is not Balintwak. So studying modern Arnis is not learning Balintwak, especially, I'll tell you this, I'll say this here. You can tell me if, um, if we're talking about people who are actively teaching modern Arnis to the public. Okay. I know some, so people, gonna, if you're not training with one of the three of us that are in this picture right now, you're not going to see that modern Balintwak fusion. Okay. You're not going to see the Balintwak that Remy blended in per se. You're going to see, because if you're not going to, if you're doing modern East and you're saying you're doing tappy tappy, if it's not a handful of people like us here, you're not going to get that Balintwak element. A lot of them are just working on the left on right tappy tappy, which is not what Remy did. In Balintwak. In Balintwak. Uh, Balintwak has a live hand. <laughs> um, we don't rely on grabbing. Correct. Okay. Now, and then uh, I'm just on a personal, like, okay, we're talking about the Flint group because there's multiple lineage, not the Flint group. We're talking about the Bacan Bullet lineage. Um, who do you think, like, okay, if you're pe people who are teaching... Who, okay, so I'm going to tell a quick story and then we'll go But uh, with this question, but, you know, because this is going to tie into the question. I've always deferred to Rich when it comes to Blintwalk. When it comes, when I have a question, I, I reach out to Rich. We would talk when Ted was alive. We talked after Ted passed away. And a lot of it is just, uh, you know, brush up something here or there. Hey, when you do this one, blah, 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 blah. You know, the one that kind of goes like this. You know, like modern, a lot of non-names there. And we can do it over the phone. We don't have to do video. That's there a good go. thing. And, and, and <laughs> well, we could describe it over the telephone. You know the one that went, yeah, yeah, I got that one, yeah. So um, Ted was T-boned in a car accident, and the car rolled. It broke his knee. I was the first class after Ted was cleared to training, and I had the first private lesson. So I asked him, I go, Manung Ted. You know, thank God you're okay. But heavens forbid something happened, who would I train with? Hmm. Okay. Because I already lost Remy. I, I, and thank God nothing happened to you in this, you know, nothing permanent happened to you. Would I train? And I didn't want to say Rich's name because Rich is my friend. I threw out Dave Hatch's name. I said, should I, should I train with Dave Hatch? Who's definitely one of the senior students of Ted's. He just looked at me, smiled, and we continued on, which told me I didn't need any help that I had enough because it was the way those non-answers are all part of that Filipino culture. Mm -hmm. That being said, I still defer to rich. He, you know, I knew a lot, but I know rich knows has got more tools in the toolbox. Rich. Here's my question for the viewers. If they want to learn someone with someone who is with Ted at the end that's still with us that hasn't passed away what five names or so would you say that would be able to teach the Bacon Boot lineage now I will say that if my name comes up I do teach hybrid but I isolate the different aspects you know I'll say hey this is we're going to do Ted's brand we're going to do we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do the grouping style, you know. But you know, so I'm up front saying that I'm doing a hybrid delivery system. But that being said, what names? Let's say five names. What, what? Who do you think you would? Uh, well, let's put it this way: if you weren't okay, I'm gonna say the person to go to is Rich. Boom! I said that. You don't have to say it. I said that. If I wasn't teaching. I would go to Rich, and even now that I teach, he's. <laughs> I'm always on the bat phone with Rich. Help me with this. So, excluding yourself, because <clears throat> I already put you on the list. What four or five names would you recommend people to go to train, who were with Ted at the end and were up to date with the material? Um, let me back into that question. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So previously we discussed that there was 35 plus or minus people on the picture board, maybe 50 some students, you know what I mean? So the list is small to start with, right? Right, right. Um, so you, myself, Dave Hatch and Paul Janulis all taught events at different times in the early half of the 2000s when Ted was healthy and teaching and he knew about it. It wasn't behind his back, didn't find about it later. It was, he knew about it up front, right? So he could have said no and did. Matter of fact, my first couple of events, I always made sure I asked him. He'd ask me what I'd want to teach and we would discuss it and he would say, go ahead. Um, so there was that aspect. Um, Jim Power and Rob Perkins were both working um, training groups, right? Mm -hmm. Jim has passed. Rob Perkins has also passed. Mm -hmm. um, Ian Kinder wasn't interested in progressing the art. He wanted it for his own personal timing and skill sets. Um, Ian Kershaw was more about just his own personal training as well. Um, so that leaves um, Rocky, who was doing his own thing, which was also, like you said, a modified approach, right? Because he was doing some of the McCall Moranga inserts as well. Um, so I know Paul's been busy with the military. Um, I know Wayne Wells has been training with me and uh, Dave and uh, Rob Rison as well with Dave. Um, those would be the senior active ones, like I said, including yourself. Um, but to be honest, I would say myself and Dave Hatch for the traditional aspect of it. Um, and then getting your hybrid program and then for the introduction is probably gonna reach more people just because of your audience. Um, so um, if I start pulling in five, I start looking at, you know, a lot of people who are doing the similar things you are. So that would be you, possibly Rocky, and then um, Paul Janios probably. But he, as he said to me himself, he's like, needs to work out the rust and, and uh, fine tune a few things. But I know he was told he could uh, work a teaching group as well. So study group, so. Okay. All right, so, all right, cool. Um, you know, so if you're interested in studying, um, I need to, are you taking students out by you? Yes. Yeah, we, uh, we need to get up on uh, having a slide with people's contact information, but mm -hmm. send me your contact. Okay, so this is going to be, this is on YouTube as well. So please, everybody, as always, please subscribe to the channel, like the video, hit the notification button, and please feel free to share this information anywhere you feel appropriate. But we will have Rich's contact information below. So if you're in the Flint, Michigan area, actually say Detroit, even though I mean, Michiganers, Basically, if, if you don't know about Michigan, if you're in Detroit, if you're in Michigan, you're in Detroit. I like you can be three, four hours away. They still consider you Detroit. I don't, I don't, I think, I think it's Detroit and then the UP and that's about it. Yeah. The <laughs> upper lower peninsula and then the UP. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, everyone's commuting so far to work for one of the, one of the big engine, uh, you know, one of the big car companies out there. So they're commuting three, four hours in three, four hours. You can cross the state. <laughs> So, so it's pretty much the entire state. But if you're in Flint, which is an hour north, for those who would be visiting Michigan, for the rest of us who will live in a normal state, you would you would um, uh, get to Detroit, and it's about an hour north of Detroit. Um, so, but I will have his contact information information here. Um, you you run a class on Sunday night still. Yes. Now remember, this podcast it's frozen in time, so you definitely need to look things up to make sure that schedules didn't change when we say this. Um, you, what's your website? FMAClub.net. 
and BalintaWalk.org. BalintaWalk.org and FMAClub.net. Okay. Um, PG, Ty, you got anything? Ty, you got anything, uh, got anything uh, for us tonight before we wrap things up? Uh, nothing, wrap- nothing else, and I don't get any mean questions that will put him on the spot like that. <laughs> Okay. But no, I don't got any closeout things. I don't think. Uh, is, hey, Rich, what, was there anything that you actually wanted to make sure we covered that we distracted you with our strange questions from? <laughs> um, there is one thing. Um, so I use the title master, and Ted doesn't give out ranks. Ted doesn't give out titles, and people are like, "Why are you using the title master in Balintawak if Ted didn't give it to you?" I know why. So okay. Why? Go ahead. One of you guys. No, no, you do it. You're. I can't tell a story. You saved my life. Well, it's it's Eugene gave you the title. Well, didn't didn't give you the title. You earned the title because of Eugene. It's a recognition by right. peers. Yes. So Eugene would, would come out to visit um, when I'm Ted. He stayed at my house. We were playing. Um, he was doing some outside techniques outside my shoulders that I wouldn't even block out. So I gave him a little backhand to the. Um, slap to the shoulder he looked at me and i told him to hit me touched me hit me harder he did hit me harder did it again i said now you got three to one i said so no matter what happens you can tell everybody you hit me three to one <laughs> he laughed as well so i said it so if you can hit me in the shoulder i'll, I'll admit that that's a headshot right so if i can't block this i'll, I'll admit you could hit me in the head. as soon as he could give me something i could block and i could react to it and put my stick near him and then he started changing it from rich to master rich. And I told him, look, we're in my house. We don't need any titles. We don't need anything. It's just Eugene and rich, right? Not master Eugene, master rich and back and forth. So the next day he goes down and he talks to Ted. Well, I said, I'm at work. So I leave about 1.30, 2 o'clock to get there a little bit after 2. And so there's five or six people at, at Ted's house. And this was in between his two strokes. So he's had the first stroke. And then the second stroke hasn't happened yet. So you can still talk a little bit, uh, move a little bit. And um, he, uh, Eugene's like, oh, Master Rich, how you doing? And some people are getting upset. Some people are getting mad. Some people are freaked out by it. I keep trying to correct them. Ted reaches over and puts his hand on mine and says, it's okay. So then I wait for the next three hours for everybody to leave. Um, and then turns into dinner time. Finally, I get a chance to ask Ted, I go, why is it okay? He says, you picked up a stick. You crossed sticks with him. You crossed hands with him. He gave you that respect for that. He told me what you did. He told me how he he was having problems with you at that day. So that day, that time, (laughs) you know what I mean? So, okay, fine, great. Um, So, he says, you can use it. And I said, well, others seemed frustrated or upset. He goes, well, then let them pick up a stick and go train with others. And that was part of his old school mindset of if you are going to go claim something, you have to defend it. So if you're going to get the respect from your peers, then you have to go out and meet your peers, interact with your peers. If you just stay you know, in your own private garage club or whatever, then you're just an instructor, which is great, right? But don't expect everybody to acknowledge who you are, your skill set, until there's some interaction with them. And for those that don't know, uh, Eugene is is very fast. He's known for his speed. So if he's going to recognize Rich that way, you know, Rich is very analytical and methodical and that kind of things. But it doesn't mean he can't be fast. If someone like Master Eugene is going to say that they had problems with him, maybe you need to rethink what you think you see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody complains I'm too slow when I teach, but I like to break it down methodically, as you said. You know what our friend Bruce says: slow is smooth, and smooth is fast. Correct. All right. Well, uh, Rich, thanks for being on the show. Uh, we're gonna probably do some more, more things in the future. We'd love to have you back. I think if uh, let's see what people think about that. I, I don't see there being a problem. I yeah, the next time I'll be in the room and you guys will have the pie machine. <laughs> there you go. Well, actually, okay, so... Um, hey, Jason. Hey, Jason. 
just so everyone knows, the last weekend of August is the Remy Prices Memorial Camp. And uh, we are three of the instructors that will be there. PG Ty, Master Rich, and myself will all be teaching. We'll be instructing each other, I guess. Is that what we're doing? Yeah, it'll be the three. Actually, we got, we got a bunch of people. Uh, Excellent. I've got a Canadian viewing crew coming. Or, oh, perfect. Or watching. So uh, Craig is doing a weekend getaway at his place. Perfect. Uh, yeah, for sure. Bring him back. Such a good episode. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you, Chairman. All right. So, uh, Rich, thanks for popping in. And once again, uh, FMA club dot net or dot com. And then uh, blintwalk dot org. Okay. All right. Uh, Rich, hold on. With, we'll be right back here. Okay. So, everybody, you know, once again, I want to thanks for coming on. We had a little. We had a little debacle, and Maria says, "Rich, respect." Excellent. Yes, who guy? Uh, and he and uh, here we go. I learned a ton from Rich in '93, and his mind. Now he can still hear this, by the way. Uh, you <laughs> oh, know, shucks. I was going to say just, something, but I won't. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 he can still hear us. So we're just, <laughs> we're just, we're just like because he talks just as much as we do, and we'll be here till four in the morning or so. Because <laughs> last week's show, even though it ended like it. 11 o'clock. I didn't leave the building till one in the morning, Ty. I don't know what happened. We and we can't do that the week that you're coming out here, by the way. We gotta make That's sure because if you're gonna if you're driving up, but anyways, listen. Um, we skipped the tirade. I'm gonna talk about that next week. We'll talk about how I'm allegedly tearing people down to build myself up. So if you're still listening to this, look at my body of work and we'll talk about that next week. Um <laughs> I got some other things we'll be discussing. Next week is about the forms. Modern these forms, what they are, and their applications. Excellent. The deliveries and stuff like that. I was in class when Remy gave him his black. That's great. Good, LOL. good memory. This That's a good memory. Okay. All right. So listen, as always. Oh. oh all right. Thank you guys. More power. We love to, hey, we love it when our brothers and sisters in the Philippines give Absolutely. us a shout out. Love it, yep. love it, love it, love it. Um so, um, especially when it's fr- rem- f- a family of Remy's, because that's mm-hmm. even more special for us, you know. Um, so, the weekend of the 27th is the Remy Preston Memorial Camp here in Buffalo. We'll be here. International attendees, we do have a special for you if, uh, for our hybrid. We will be doing virtual classes. Just give me a holler if you're interested. Um, and then we'll have the hotel is full. We have all the restrictions off. So, we'll have plenty of people there. Uh, we don't have to worry about any of that. And someone just messaged me. I'm going to see if that's important. Uh, yeah, okay. Rich sent me the information. I will be sharing that on the um, on the page. All right. Uh, any closing words, my friend? Uh, if you're in Pennsylvania, the middle of Pennsylvania, next weekend, uh, there's a, a gathering. I think we mentioned last time that I'm teaching at in Pennsylvania, the 20, what is it? Sac first? Anyway, Saturday. Okay, uh, and, and then the following week, of course, we're at Buffalo. Yep. yep, yep. Are you you driving up from there to here? No, you're going on for a day or two. I'm going on for a day or two. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're crazier than I am. Yep. Okay, all right. Listen, everybody, as always, please stay safe and stay sane. More the latter these days. <laughs> the latter will keep the former going there. Yep. But um, you know, I'm just looking forward to seeing more of you face to face. Uh, this is Dr. Tim and BG Ty saying thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next week.